And um, if, I, if I may ask, would you mind while um, the proceedings are on to maybe just um, stop your video so as to save some bandwidth and remember to mute yourself in the meantime. But if you want to talk at any time, then please remember to unmute yourself again. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen and showing you something about um, Cement and Concrete SA. Because we're very happy to be presenting the this series of Concrete Fix, which is a monthly, um, a monthly online webinar series. And I hope that you can all see my, my screen, my presentation at the moment. Natasha, would you just confirm? Yes, Anli, I can definitely see it. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So welcome to um, today's um, installment of Concrete Fix, the series. Um, and just a bit more about Cement and Concrete SA. We say thank you to our partner members who are AFRISAM, Lafarge, PPC and Sapaku. We've got two gold members, SEMSA and Creso Sangobain. Four silver members, Chioli Redimix, Corestruck, Quick Group and Seeker. And then we're also very pleased to have a number of bronze members on board. I'm just going to run through their um, logos. If you have a look, there are three screens of bronze members. You can identify your, your own company there. Our bronze members, we're grateful for them. And then, of course, our associate members, those are similar bodies and professional bodies in South Africa. And our academic members. Always good to, to have them on board, as well as the students they represent, not just the research staff, but the students as well. And if you haven't seen your logo there, it means your company is not a member of Cement and Concrete SA. And I, I would um, encourage you to, to think of joining. Cement and Concrete SA has got a wealth of information available. There's a very um, powerful website and our web address is on your screen at the moment. And all our notices are posted on um, Instagram and the addresses at the bottom, the, the names at the bottom. And we also post everything on LinkedIn. So please in future look, at on, look out for what we're presenting on the social media and visit our website to see what, what's happening. Then about Concrete Baton, the March issue of Concrete Baton is online on our website at the moment. It's got a huge amount of technical and industry information and some interesting uh, a little column called Con Concrete Conversations. There's also the summary of the um, AFRISAM's budget unpacked, um, where Dr. Azar Jamin and Trevor Manuel spoke about the implications of the South African budget for our economy and the construction industry. So please make sure that you read Concrete Baton online on our website. Then remember that Fulton's Concrete Technology, the 10th edition, was published last year. It's available for sale um, from the um, Information Center in Midrand. You can contact them on info at semcon-sa.org.za. And the South African price is 990 rand for members, uh, plus postage and, uh, and that. And if you're logging in from, from outside the country, please get in touch with the Information Center. They'll let you know what the cost would be, which will include the courier cost. Then a reminder about our School of Concrete Technology. Um, they doing during the lockdown, it was limited to um, online courses, but then now they've gone back to classroom based um, courses, which is what um, Brent was saying earlier. We're all looking so we all we all need to interact with people again. And it's wonderful that at times that we can actually get back and see each other in person. So classroom based and online courses. And please talk to them about the best concrete technology educational path for you. Um, it is so important to make sure that you keep up to date or that you, you touch up on some concrete technology that you, you may have forgotten and not, not used in the, in the meantime. Um, remember that all concrete fix events carry CPD accreditation. 
I've mentioned um, last uh, month that um, there was a slight hiccup with our accreditation body. It's been sorted, and I know that Natasha has been working in the background to get all our previous um, events, the past three or four events, the accreditation certificates will be available very soon. So if you need CPD points, make sure that you send your details to Natasha. She was the lady that you RSVP. Um, RSVP to, to attend today's meeting and her email is on the slide as well. And then our concrete fix in um, on the 21st of April, the next one will be Professor Mark Alexander who's going to be talking about aggregates for concrete and not just your traditional aggregates, also the aggregates derived from what we call non-conventional sources such as industrial sources and um, demolition materials and that. So please look out for the invitation, which will go out soon, which will also be on social media. But just a heads up, that will be the, the concrete fix for, um, for April. And then coming attractions. On the 19th of May, our concrete fix will be presented by Dr. Rod Rankin. He's going to be talking about on cracking of concrete. And a subject that we don't like, like to address because we're all for excellence in concrete. But unfortunately, while we're working with concrete, cracking is a given. And it's how you manage it and um, how you identify the cracks. That is how we, we ensure that we've got good structures. Then the inland branch has got um, an event, more of a social event called a bowl splits coming up soon. Keep your eyes and ears open for notices about that, as well as a concrete quiz. And the Kuzulu Natal branch is also planning a concrete quiz for um, April. And then <coughs> something that I want to mention that those of you who attended the Fulton Awards in the past would have remembered that we had a banner competition. And that was um, salient points about all the um, entered projects and then a questionnaire about that. Now we're going to do an online poster competition along the same lines. So keep your eyes and ears open for the notices about our online poster competition that will go live soon. And we're very happy to say that CoreStruck has, has actually um, taken up a sponsorship for this online poster competition. So keep your eyes and ears open for that. And then also just a reminder, um, the, the more information will follow soon, but the Fulton Awards, the gala event will be held on 10th of June in Gauteng and simultaneously in KwaZulu-Natal and the Western Cape, with the, the actual proceedings, the announcement of the winners will be broadcast to the other two venues. So that promises to be a, a, a lovely event. And then what I would like to end with is just to say, Cement and Concrete SA is the unified platform in South Africa for cement and concrete for the industry. Um, Please join as a member, be it an individual member or a company member, and let's build the future together. But now today's um, event is made possible with a kind sponsorship of um, CRESO, and we thank them for, for their sponsorship. And I've got a short message from CRESO, a video that I want to share with you. So let me just get that up and I'll share. Bear with me for a moment. Um, I'm going to share this now.
that message from Krisa, our sponsor for our Concrete Fix series. So ladies and gentlemen, but the, the main business of today, we've actually come to listen to Brent Rollins presenting to us on concrete durability or improving concrete durability with colloidal silica. And um, we're very happy to have Brent with us today. Thank you to Carl for arranging this. Brent is the Vice President of Business Development for Spalock Concrete Protection, a Chattanooga, Tennessee-based producer of colloidal silica. Before joining the company in 2017, he spent seven years as a university researcher and consultant and 20 years in the ready mix industry. Mr. Rollins has consulted and published globally, principally on the topics of concrete durability and infrastructure resilience, and he serves on several committees with ACM and ACI. He lives in Dalton, Georgia with his wife, Leslie, and his two young sons, Evan and Isaac. So Brent, we're really so happy that you're joining us um, early in your morning. Please, you can start sharing the screen now, and we look forward to what you're going to share with us today. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, Hanley. And uh, thank you, Natasha, for your, your help in, in putting this together as well. Uh, give me just a second, and I should get this going. Let's see. Let me say that um, you should see my, uh, my screen now. We do. Thank you. Yes. Good. Yeah. So let me just say that, thankfully, I am not having to follow Professor Mark Alexander and Dr. Rankin. <laughs> uh, and instead, I'm getting to go in front of them, which uh, for me is, is uh, a bonus. So uh, just a few brief words uh, of thanks. I, I really appreciate everyone's time today. I hope my uh, southern U.S. accent is not too hard to follow. Um, we're going to have some fun today. We're going to learn about colloidal silica and what it can do for concrete durability. Um, but we're also, uh, uh, we're also going to explore concrete itself a little bit at the beginning, and we'll get into that in just a second. So um, I do want to say thank you to each and every one of you for, for the time this morning or this afternoon, your time. So with questions, uh, I want to make sure we have some time for questions. Henley, what uh, what time should, should I uh, target for stopping? Brent, if you would mind, uh, not mind stopping at about 10 to, which will be 10 to 4 our time, I think 10 to 10 your time. Okay. And then we'll, we'll allow about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So just a few brief comments about my background. Um, the part that the bio didn't capture adequately uh, is, is that I'm a concrete nerd. Okay. Concrete's all I've ever done. It's, it's when I was 16 years old was when I first went to work in the concrete industry and I quickly fell in love with it, as many of you have. Um, and it really comes from playing a part in seeing the construction projects that I was involved with being completed. And my job satisfaction came from, uh, you know, as a young, young guy, 16, 17 years old, being part of some rather large projects in the North Georgia and Southern Tennessee area. Uh, and then uh, the wonderful opportunity to do some research at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga afterwards gave me the opportunity to really uh, work on my passion, which was to figure out why concrete wasn't lasting as long as we want it to. What, what was the problem with concrete durability? What technologies existed that could assist with concrete durability? That was what drove me uh, and what my passion was while I was at the university. Um, and I had the wonderful opportunity to research and play with whatever I wanted to, as long as I brought the, the funding in, the university didn't care. And uh, that's when I ran across colloidal silica for the first time. And colloidal silica, we'll get into just what it is and what it does in a moment, but we were able to do some research projects and publish six or seven papers and go defend those papers at places like uh, CONSEC and uh, Actually, uh, uh, Hans Baushausen hosted a conference in Cape Town for FIB, I believe, uh, in 2016 that, that we were able to present that. So we've had a wonderful uh, uh, journey of publication. And, uh, but in 2017, Spraylock Concrete Protection has invited me to join the private sector to do more than just write about political silica. That was my opportunity to really try to promote the product 
for what it can do for durability. And I've been thankful ever since. So I know you guys don't need a brief Portland cement concrete overview, but I, I think it's important to explain where colloidal silica fits. We know that you guys know Portland cement is the binder, main binder that makes up uh, Portland cement concrete. And all you really need is water, Portland cement, and aggregates to have concrete. But most modern concrete contains also pozzolans or supplementary cementitious materials. Here in the US, we blend our pozzolans at the ready mix level or the precast level. We actually get them straight from the pozzolan source and we do the blending with the cement ourselves. In many markets, it's pre-blended by the cement supplier. But these pozzolans or supplementary cementitious materials have become a very important part of most modern concrete. And then of course, chemical admixtures making up the, the final piece of the puzzle. Most modern concrete, if not all, contains admixtures of some kind. And admixtures exist for just about everything you can think of you might want your concrete to do. So the good thing is colloidal silica works with almost all available chemical admixtures. But where we want to look at first or where we want to concentrate is on pozzolans or supplementary cementitious materials. Some of these may be familiar to you. Fly ash is the most common, most uh, widely used pozzolan worldwide. It's a byproduct of the coal burning power industry. So the, the fly ash is collected in some electrostatic collectors. It's then uh, the, the, the ash that's then appropriate for use in concrete is separated out and it's able to be used as a pozzolan or supplementary cementitious material. Uh, however, here in the US, we're getting away from coal as a power supply. We're using a lot more natural gas now than we were previously. And that means that fly ash is becoming in short supply. So a lot of alternative supplementary cementitious materials are being looked at and being used, things that have been used for years, such as slag cement, such as metakaolin, silica fume, all of these different pozzolans. But one new one you may have not seen before is ground glass. Ground glass pozzolans are, have been a topic of conversation at the ASTM and ACI conferences and conventions that I've been to in the last four years or so. Ground glass pozzolans are coming down the pike. Uh, they, they are absolutely, uh, so far, looks, look to be decent pozzolans. Um, and I wanted to give you guys sort of a, a nugget of a heads up. Ten years from now, you may be seeing some commercial suppliers of ground glass pozzolans trying to get that into concrete. And so far, it seems to be working fine. And then finally, colloidal silica. The important thing to remember here is that all of these pozzolans, all of these supplementary cementitious materials have one major thing in common, and that is they're excellent providers of something called amorphous silicon dioxide, the, and that's opposed to crystalline silicon dioxide. Some of you may be uh, aware of some of the crystalline products that are on the market. Amorphous silicon dioxide is ready to react. It's ready to do what we want it to do in the concrete mix. And the reason that pozzolans play an important role in concrete is twofold. Number one, pozzolans are typically less expensive than Portland cement concrete economically. Number two, pozzolans typically produce much less greenhouse gas emissions than Portland cement manufacturer does. So we know that Portland cement manufacturers worldwide are, are aware of and addressing the uh, CO2 greenhouse gas emissions in their manufacturing process. And there are some pretty aggressive goals by companies like Cemex, Lafarge, and others that have mentioned uh, that they want to uh, have greener processes. The most important thing to know about uh, pozzolans is that colloidal silica is just another pozzolan in one sense of the word. It is a much, much finer pozzolan than even silica fume or microsilica in that it is a nano-sized silicon dioxide particle. So just a quick overview of the simplified pozzolanic reaction. What does a pozzolan do in concrete? Well, if you take cement and water, you mix them together, ideally they're gonna get hard and gain strength, right? And gain durability. Well, the main 
reaction product that's formed that provides most of that strength and durability is calcium silicate hydrate. So when you mix cement and water, CSH is the workhorse of the concrete mix that's providing that strength that we want. There's an additional, there are many other reaction products, but one of the additional reaction products is calcium hydroxide or Portlandite. That calcium hydroxide doesn't do much for concrete. It sits around waiting on something to react with. It's highly reactive. Things like sulfates, nitrates, other things that attack concrete often attack calcium hydroxide. But if you add a pozzolan to the, to the mix, then, and, and the reason I picked that picture, the picture of the volcano, by the way, just as an aside, is that the word pozzolan comes from the region of Pozzuoli, Italy, where uh, Mount Vesuvius erupted in, in CD 79, spewing the countryside with ash. And the Romans found that when they harvested that ash and integrated it into the concrete, that their concrete became more workable, lasted longer, et cetera. So that's where we get the word puzzle. Um, but back to our main topic. So if you take a puzzle in and put it into the concrete, then it's going to react with that calcium hydroxide to produce, guess what? more of that CSH that gives concrete strength and durability. That's the reason we like to use pozzolans. And the reason that we love, or the reason I fell in love with colloidal silica is because it's such an excellent source of, of the pozzolanic reaction. It's tiny size, it's nano size, gives it many, many more times effectiveness than even silica beam. So, the next step in our concrete discussion is to talk about water and concrete. So we got the pozzolans, we understand how pozzolans fit, and we understand that colloidal silica is, is a pozzolan. Now we got to look at where does the water go? What happens to the water in concrete? And it will, the reason I'm going down this pathway will become apparent in just a second. First, bleed water. When we, we mix concrete, even with the very best admixture technologies, then we need more water in that concrete mix than is needed for that initial chemical reaction in most concrete mixes. That water, what we call water of convenience, that's above and beyond that initial chemical reaction water, some of it has to leave during the setting stage. And it leaves through a series of capillary bleed water channels that are formed and the water then evaporates. From the and that's during the setting process. Once that concrete sets, once it hardens, then from the time it sets until 28, 60, 90 days, even later, depending on thickness and in the environment the concrete is in, then it's still losing additional water known as evaporable water. That's water that, that leaves slowly. And then you have non-evaporable water. That non-evaporable water is trapped inside in between some of the plate-like structures that are formed when the, when the concrete sets. And that, that non-evaporable water can be consumed at much later ages. And then you have finally the reaction water. That reaction water is consumed during the cement hydration reaction. So these types of water are important to consider because of mainly this bleed water and evaporable water stages. That's the stages we're going to concentrate on. And the reason that we call attention to that is that we know concrete is permeable. Most of the time, it doesn't feel or look permeable. The average lay person who doesn't study concrete most likely doesn't think of concrete as being permeable. Because after all, when you're a kid and you're riding your bicycle you know, along a concrete driveway or something and you fall off and you, you skin your knee, it certainly doesn't feel permeable. It doesn't feel like a sponge or, a, or anything that is full of little holes. But those bleed water channels that form when that concrete is setting, those tiny little void structures that form, as well as additional capillary void, voids that form, actually leaves in the concrete a route of ingress into the concrete for water and the contaminants that water carries. That's important because that's the way that concrete is attacked in most instances. If you look at ACI 515, 
protective treatments for concrete structures. You're going to see, or concrete surfaces, sorry. You're going to see a list of attack tables. Those attack tables are different chemicals. I think there's eight or 10 pages of them. There's different chemicals that attack concrete in different ways. And from those tables, you can determine that most, if not almost all, attack the concrete by getting into the concrete through the permeability that's present. Now I choose this picture for the background of the slide for a very important reason. This was uh, a basement wall uh, about six stories below ground in Manhattan. Uh, I was asked to go take a look at this particular building because they had moisture infiltration uh, coming, coming through the walls. And when I saw this brown stain, this running diagonally here, I knew that there was a significant problem in this, at the time, 10-year-old concrete. Uh, at that point, I told the, the building superintendent that it was time for him to engage a forensic engineer. And the reason is that this was evidence to me that some reinforcing steel corrosion was occurring. Now, reinforcing steel corrosion is the major reason that concrete doesn't last as long as we want it to. If we can figure out a way to slow or stop the reinforcing steel corrosion, in many cases, we can greatly extend the life of concrete. So this is an over-exaggeration of what the permeability of concrete looks like. It's not this wall's concrete, but I wanted to show you that under a scanning electron microscope, you can see that concrete is permeable. Don't take Brent's word for it though. I know you just met me, most of you, some of you I've met before, but Concrete permeability is directly related to permeability, well, inversely related to permeability. Um, I won't read the slide, you can, you can read it yourself, but uh, I like Portland Cement Association's uh, definition, that's the, your American counterpart out of Skokie, Illinois. Um, and they basically describe it like this. There are many causes of concrete de deterioration, but most of them involve the movement of water and the things that water carries, such as, sulfates, chlorides, nitrates, et cetera, that are dissolved in the water. Generally, the lower your permeability is, the greater your durability is gonna be with concrete and vice versa. The greater your permeability is, the lower your concrete durability is. And it directly impacts our concrete longevity. So one of the discoveries that I made when I was at the university studying durability is that concrete wasn't lasting as long as we wanted it to. And some of that, some of the cause for that is for years, we were assuming that our concrete was durable. Uh, some of you may know Adam Neville, uh, the famed concrete researcher from the UK who's published hundreds of books and, and thousands of papers. Uh, well, I don't know if it's hundreds of, he, he published several books and thousands of papers. Dr. Neville is the first that I'm aware of that in the early 2000s, reported that yes, concrete changed in the 1970s, that the cement began to be ground finer and other changes occurred where concrete strengths were available to us with less cement content than we had used prior to the 1970s. So in other words, we could use higher water to cement ratios and get the strengths that we were shooting for, compressive strengths that we were shooting for than previously possible. Before the 1970s, we didn't use a lot of admixtures, and we also had uh, cements that required a lower water content to get compressive strengths. So durability was a given. Unfortunately, that means that now we have to consider durability as a separate animal, as a separate uh, variable in the design process. When you have your strength, you don't necessarily have the durability that you're wanting to get as evidenced by some statistics I'm about to share. So these are statistics that are available to me. They are US-based, but I found that the problem is not just a US problem. The problem does exist worldwide. But I'm mean, gonna use the US as an example. In 2012, the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE, published our infrastructure report card where they describe in it that one in six of our bridges in the U.S. was in severe need of repair or even a replacement. That category was called structurally deficient. 
Now, we have over 600,000 bridges in this country. That gives you an idea of the magnitude of the repair that's needed in our bridges. There was a 2015 study that demonstrated that 40% of our states were designing our normal concrete bridge deck mixes with an expected corrosion life cycle of less than 30 years. That's a big problem. Now, those were all designed to get strength. They all had a compressive strength target, and that was fine, but many of them were only 40% of them were expected to last less than 30 years. ICRI, the International Concrete Repair Institute, uh, estimates that 18 to 20 billion US dollars a year is spent on repairing concrete buildings annually, and that concrete buildings are generally only expected to last 50 or 60 years. Some of my work, I'm engaging with um, different municipalities throughout the country and throughout the world, and I'm seeing, especially in areas with free stall where the icing salts are used, that we're having some sidewalks and pavements that are lasting less than five years. And that is not uh, a sustainable pace. From all of these, this is a, just evidence of a durability problem. Um, and in my book, you know, we, we mentioned the cement companies and their green initiatives earlier, and their environmental initiatives. In my book, the very best approach that we can have to sustainability and a green concrete approach is to make structures that last a very long time. Thankfully, the technology is available now and it's not too terribly expensive. So all of that background, we get now to colloidal silica. And the reason that we have all that background and just a short amount of time to talk about colloidal silica is that colloidal silica is a simple, simple material. It's just silicon dioxide on the nanoscale. That's all it is, it's just tiny, tiny particles. It, those tiny particles, that size is the key to its performance, along with the distribution package that's used so a colloid is, is just a suspension, right, uh, to, to simplify it. If we assume that this, whole, this concrete pore that you see in the picture is, is as deep as it is wide, 20 microns, then that small third of the human hair diameter size pore would hold about 700,000 average size colloidal silicon particles. So... The small size of colloidal silica is important for two reasons. Number one, that means that the colloidal silica can reach almost all of the interconnected pore space in concrete. Number two, it means that it has a tremendous amount of surface area. Now, Konstantin Sobolev uh, from the uh, University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee is the outgoing chair of ACI 241, nanomaterials and concrete. Uh, Dr. Sobolev allows me to use this graph. He developed it as long as I give a shout out to him, which I just did. So uh, colloidal silica is the smallest of the small. These are log relationships. You can see that the surface area that's available is the highest of all the materials on the graph. And you can see that you're in the category of nano engineered concrete when you're using colloidal silica. It can be introduced into concrete as an additive at the time of mixing, like an admixture. You can put it in there um, as you're mixing the concrete. It has the advantage of treating the entire load of concrete. It's gonna stay around in the concrete until that calcium hydroxide becomes available and then it's gonna react. However, there is still gonna be some void space present. It's gonna greatly reduce uh, permeability, but Again, we use more water than is needed for that initial chemical reaction, and it's going to escape somehow. So there is going to be some void formation. If you were to ask me what the best way to use colloidal silica is for durability and waterproofing, I'm going to tell you that a spray applied treatment is the way to go. And the reason is that we allow those voids to form naturally. And then we apply about the time you can walk on the concrete is when we apply the colloidal silica. It penetrates deeply. And the least we've ever seen, for instance, is uh, uh, around 38 millimeters on a, on a 100 millimeter slab. That's the least we've seen now. We often see much more. Than that. 
you have two ways that it can be used. It can be used at time of placement or about the time you can walk on the concrete, about the time without leaving an impression. That's where you get the most benefit because you're closing up that void space early and holding evaporable water in the concrete. That means that it can be used as a curing mechanism when applied to new concrete. Because these re it's naturally forming these reaction products that holds that moisture in, then when you use compressive strength development and drying shrinkage as your metrics for curing, it will beat even moist curing for 28 days. No one moist cures concrete for 28 days that I'm aware of. Rarely do you see moist curing done for more than seven days. It can, however, also be applied to existing concrete. This is just a quick little cartoon video demonstrating how it's applied. It's applied to the surface, penetrates into the concrete deeply, where it reacts and closes the void space with that pozzolanic reaction that we talked about earlier, CSH. You're essentially closing void space with more concrete. In fact, you're gonna see in a few minutes a scanning electron microscope image where you're not going to see a foreign substance in the concrete. The colloidal silica changes forms. It reacts and turns into CSH. It can be applied to horizontal, vertical, and even overhead. That's because in its liquid form, it is drawn into the concrete. We believe it's an ionic process. That's the only thing that makes sense uh, is that there is uh, some charge uh, attraction going on. But if you were to push me on that and, and write it down on paper like we did in school, uh, I couldn't do that accurately. But our observations are that overhead applications penetrate just as deeply as horizontal applications. It's important to remember that colloidal silica is not a silicate. You may have uh, been thinking of some of the older technologies because silica and silicate sound so similar. Those crystalline technologies have been on the market for since the 1950s in a lot of cases. Those silicates have a place in the market and most of the time that's gonna be in the floor hardener type uh, area. However, colloidal silica is an amorphous silicon dioxide particle that's ready to react on the nanoscale. It's much, much more effective than the silicates. It's not a membrane former. So see colloidal silica on existing concrete applications, for instance, it's not gonna bridge your cracks. You're going to want to apply first the colloidal silica. You want to apply it first, allow it to coat the sidewalls of the crack to shut down that lateral water movement, and then come back with your injection material or other crack repair uh, materials. It's not the solution to all concrete related problems. I know that I'm, I'm really uh, telling you a lot about it and, and I'm excited about it. I love colloidal silica. In my opinion, it's the most important concrete technology advancement in the last 50 years. Um, but if you were to call me with a particular problem, it's not gonna fix everything. It can fix a lot because all it's doing, again, it's a simple action. It's closing void space with more reaction product. It is absolutely the best known provider of the pozzolanic reaction. It's a great way to reduce the permeability of concrete and it's a treatment that lasts for the lifetime of the concrete. So I've got about five more minutes before we conclude the presentation. I want to share some of the testing so that it's not just uh, Brent saying, trust me, right? I wanna share some information, uh, some testing information. First of all, there are over, since 2000, more than 50 research teams spanning over hundred papers of published results demonstrating improved property, properties of concrete containing fluid of silica. The American Society of Testing and Materials has two current working groups working on specifications to be included in their publications for colloidal silica. Now, the reason we're doing this is not to, uh, uh, not saying you can't use it right now. You absolutely can. The reason we're doing this is we've got some bad actors in the market that are claiming they have a colloidal silica when they are in fact producing an old technology like a sodium silica and calling it a colloidal silica. ACI 241 nanomaterials and concrete addresses colloidal silica at length. So just uh, some quick examples. This was some testing done at Middle Tennessee State University. Um, you have concrete specimens that were made out of the same wheelbarrow, some treated and some not. This is the DIN 1048 or 
now called EN12390-8 test, where water is applied at five bar um, to the concrete. And this was a, a the test used or a, a particularly bad concrete. But I think it was a water to binder ratio of around 0.6, something like that, and it poorly graded aggregate, et cetera. The control specimens actually failed at three hours. This is a 72 hour test. And at three hours, water was coming out of the sides of the samples, which the uh, test method will tell you is a failure of the test to stop the test. The treated samples at 72 hours demonstrated uh, very little uh, penetration into the concrete. Uh, I think we called that five millimeters penetration. So we typically see with colloidal silica a reduction in hydrostatic permeability uh, somewhere in the 90 to 100% range, depending on the concrete. So integral colloidal silica can close capillary void structure, and it does a, a decent job at it. But I want to examine a particular test case at the Jano Wharf in the Congo. This was done uh, with SCP France years ago, uh, and it started with a phone call from Total Oil. Total called me up in 2015. I was still at the university, and they, they told me about a precast concrete wharf that they had for petroleum onloading. And this particular precast wharf, uh, water to cement ratio was a bit high, and they were concerned about the permeability and, and therefore the durability of this wharf. They asked if I thought colloidal silica would help extend the life of the structure. I told them, absolutely, but let's do a study. So we treated, after it was in the water a year, we treated most of the wharf and left some of it untreated. A year later, so two years total time in the wharf, we came back and took some cores. The untreated concrete at uh, a 10 millimeter depth is seen on the left here. This is a very small scale. This is a five micron scale here. So you're looking at total, total width of the specimen, diameter of the specimen is about a third of a human hair or so. And you can see that the treated area on the right is much more dense looking. Now, this was impressive when we saw these results, but what was more impressive was this. At the 15 millimeter depth, the untreated specimen had a pretty significant chloride peak after only two years in the ocean. The treated specimen showed no chlorides. This was done by X-ray spectroscopy by an independent laboratory, demonstrating that the chloride movement uh, was restricted. And we were then able to also, I think around 30 cores were taken out of the uh, project. They were then able to actually do some calculations on diffusion rate, et cetera, apparent chloride diffusion rate. We were able to show that the uh, expect life expectancy of the untreated concrete was around 15 years. The life expectancy of the treated section was somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 33 years, if I remember correctly. So you had about double the life expectancy from, from the uh, treated concrete. Now, real quick, this was a State Department of Transportation's uh, corrosion labs investigation um, in a 10% sodium chloride with continuous half cell monitoring. So ACI gives you an uncertain corrosion potential line here at the negative 200 millivolts. And you can see that the control specimen somewhere around the two year mark starts dipping into the uncertain corrosion potential. And you can see by the three year mark, it's really headed toward the uh, likely corrosion potential occurring. So <laughs> the treated sample, you can see the, the difference in corrosion behavior. And this was a, a what's called a high performance concrete or HPC mix. Um, and you can see that it, it even it was, was not performing uh, that well at the three year mark. So the way that colloidal silica can interrupt that corrosion cycle is number one, it can slow down that initiation period by slowing the chlorides from getting to the reinforcing steel. And then it can also shut off that external source of water that the Neville model uh, indicates is necessary for continued self-sustaining corrosion. 
So in those two ways, colloidal silica can extend the life of concrete. So we're, we're at the question and answer time frame. I, I don't want to, uh, to take up much, you know, any more, any more time there. I do want to close with a couple of slides demonstrating. Uh, we do have quite a bit of work there locally in, in South, Southern Africa that, we've, that uh, colloidal silica has been used, but I want to share just a visual representation of what happens when colloidal silica is applied to concrete. How is it affecting the pore structure? These cubes were made out of the same concrete, out of the same wheelbarrow. The only difference is that the one on the right was treated with a spray applied colloidal silica. And we dunked them in acid. This was done while I was at the university. Put them in a 31% hydrochloric acid. After one hour, you can see the difference. And that's just because the pore structure is being closed. You're, you're, you don't have that surface area that's being attacked. After two hours, you can obviously see the difference there. So I want to say thank you very much for, for this uh, presentation time today. You guys uh, are, are all concrete folks, and I probably spent more time than I needed to on describing concrete and where colloidal silica fits. But again, that's just because colloidal silica is a simple, uh, it's a simple, simple product. It's just tiny and therefore can react and, and, and do things that no other product can do. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and, and especially thank you to Hanley and, and, and Cement and Concrete SA. Uh, and please think of me as a, a resource for you. So we have a bit of time for some questions. Well, Britt, thank you so much for that presentation. I really found it very interesting. Um, and thank you for, for keeping to the time so, so well. We've got a raised hand, Armand. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Brent, I just want to know, um, do you only spray apply the colloidal silica after you've cast it, or can you, um, how can I say, like disperse the colloidal silica already into, into the wet mix and then cast the structure? Yeah, yeah. So integral colloidal silica uh, is available and it can be done and it will greatly reduce permeability. Um, however, it's not quite as effective as the spray applied um, because with the spray applied, we allow the voids to form naturally and then close those voids once they form. There are still some voids that form some capillary structures that form with the integral, but the permeability is, is quite reduced. If you were to ask me what the best method is, is to use both. Thanks, Brent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great question. And there are two more raised hands. Um, I can't see who they are. Will you just unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, Arartia. Yes, Arartia, go, go ahead, please. Uh, Brent, thanks for a very interesting um, presentation. When used as an additive, doesn't it make um, doesn't it make the concrete sticky? Yeah, great question. So not nearly as much as silica fume, no. So uh, silica fume or microsilica is notorious for making concrete sticky and difficult to work with. The colloidal silica, uh, because it's nano sized particles, does change the workability of the concrete. It makes it, honestly, it makes it more movable um, without changing slump. So you get, um, you get concrete that's easier to move, easier to pump, uh, set times are about the same. Um, it does not produce stickiness like the silica fume. Could I jump Thank in, Alan? Anton, go ahead. Okay, just a quick one from my side. Greetings from Croatia. Um, just a, a, a question regarding um, the cracking in concrete. Uh, you say colloidal silica cannot bridge the cracks fair enough because it works on a nanoscale. Uh, yes. But surely it helps in a reduction of cracking. Am I right? Great question. And uh, yes, so you have, with the spray applied especially, you have a reduction in drying shrinkage. We typically see 40 to 60% reduction in drying shrinkage, um, total drying shrinkage. So. Yes, you do see, you will expect to see less cracks. Now, when you describe that to someone, it's difficult because what does less cracks mean? 
<laughs> so for us, for us, we typically leave it. What I like, the way I like to leave it is 40 to 60% drying shrinkage reduction is what we typically see. Yeah, especially for water retaining structures, I believe, you know, for the basement and things like that, I think it's very much advisable to use these puzzles, you know. So that's something, you know, I think that's what I learned from you today. And certainly I will transfer that to my company in Dublin. I work for the Irish company. We do a lot of concrete in the basements, you know, yep. with the water, water ingress is, is a problematic. And this is something really to think about. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Well, well, Anton, thank you for joining us all the way from Croatia. It's wonderful to see you here this afternoon. And it's thank not you. the first time. Yeah, I I see we've got, <laughs> oh, wonderful. I see we've got three more raised hands. Um, apologies, I can't identify who you are. Um, would you just um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, Brent. Uh, I've got a question. Um, yes, ma'am. Our clients here in the UAE are really pushing for long design lives to, to, their, to their reinforced concrete structures, um, or should I say concrete structures in general. Um, and we're looking at design lives close to, you know, guys specifying, specifying 100 years to 120 years. Um, sure. And our natural response to that would obviously be to remove as much reinforcement from, from the concrete as possible to achieve these, these design lives for these key walls. Um, so if, if we approach our clients, how can we assure or, 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 or how can I say demonstrate to the clients the value of, of colloidal silica in, in improving the concrete durability? What would, what would be a good approach to, to justifying the additional cost to the project? Sure. So um, initially, uh, we, can, we can work with you. Um, to, to help with that, we can either work within life cycle models or we can do a rough, you know, back of the napkin life 365 kind of thing um, to demonstrate the low laboratory derived uh, apparent chloride diffusion rates um, to, to provide treated versus untreated performance. So you would see, in other words, uh, the way it works in the past is, is clients have come to me and they've asked, okay, well, show me the difference percent wise or your estimated number of years between treated and untreated. Um, and we can provide that. Now, if, if design life is a design parameter that, that is important to your client, which it sounds like it is, then you're gonna wanna do some testing with the exact concrete materials. Um, and th those can be depending on the level of confidence that you guys want and the level of confidence your client wants. You can do things like NT492 chloride migration, non-steady state chloride migration testing to demonstrate the difference between treated and untreated um, and to provide you with information. There are some consulting engineering companies that are using that to feed life cycle models. Um, I can provide some guidance, but uh, when it comes to the actual model, that's something you guys would, would have to have the confidence level in. So I'm, I'm here to help Dane, what I'm saying, and, and we can work through that. And uh, I was quite interested in the comment you made about the drying shrinkage. Um, we, we normally cast big capping blocks that are unreinforced, and or we try to make them unreinforced as best possible. Um, and one of the governing uh, reasons for inclusion of reinforcement is is the the shrinkage response after being cast um, and how that interacts with the restraint of the bottom blocks and let's say let's call it the key wall um, so it, it, uh, what does 40 percent reduction in drying shrinkage mean does that does that mean just overall restrict uh, reduction in the shrinkage or does it mean reduction in the shrinkage cracking capable potential for shrinkage cracking yeah so so it, it means it's a, it's a kind of a, uh, uh, so you're dealing with the drying shrinkage strain in a specimen. When I tell you 40% um, to 60% drying shrinkage reduction, we have when we have laboratory samples where that is the parameter we're using, we're measuring the drying shrinkage. Um, when it comes to measuring cracking or, or trying to determine how much cracking is going to occur then that's where you can take the level of microstrain 
into your equations okay, and put that in there conservatively to get an estimate from your calculations. That's something that we stop shy of doing because there are just so many variables there and we're not in, you know, I'm not an engineer, I'm a materials guy. So I can tell you what the material is going to do. And then from there, you can say, okay, I'm going to have this many micro strain in this structure and uh, put your calculations together to determine how it's going to affect your actual structure. I too. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Corvus, you've got your hand raised. Do you want to unmute yourself and um, and ask your question? Uh, I think I am on mute. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Yes, thank you. Hi, Brent. This is Corvus from Namibia. Hi, Corvus. Uh, now, we are on the southwest side of, uh, of Africa, and uh, we have the worst coastal aggression um, in the world. And uh, you mentioned that you can apply the product to um, existing concrete down at the coast. Um, it seems like the, colloid <coughs> the colloidal silica is absorbing all those uh, chemicals. I would just like to know if you do, for instance, a, a sewer sump, um, an existing sewer sump, and mm -hmm. you apply the colloidal silica, will it also dissolve the chemicals uh, inside the pores of the concrete? Oh, great question. Um, it doesn't dissolve the, the chemicals, but what it will do is once, so this is something that, that is a, a bit hard to believe and you'll have to see it for yourself. Um, but because it's closing void space, what we often see is expression of whatever is not bound chemically in the concrete is being pushed out. We typically see, and if I had more time, I'd share some, some data with you, but um, we typically see 30 to 50% purging of, of uh, unbound chlorides, for instance, uh, and it's visible. I mean, you'll see salt, for instance, being purged from the concrete. Um, and that's something that I know Carl has seen himself uh, as well. Um, so no, it's not going to absorb, but it will or, or destroy those chemicals, but it can remove some of them from the system by pushing them out if they're not bound chemically. Thanks a lot. I know, I know that is so science fiction sounding and I know how crazy you guys all of a sudden you're like, well, I believed him up to that point, <laughs> but <laughs> it does happen. No, thanks for that. Thank you. Um, well, this has one, been one of our most interactive um, concrete fixes yet. Um, anybody else with a question? I think all the raised hands have had their, their opportunity. Any other question? And please, please do make a note of my email address and uh, uh, reach out anytime uh, if you have more, more questions. No, no problems there. Uh, Ali, Matthews here. Yes, Matthews, go ahead. Uh, Brent, uh, afternoon on my side. Yeah, good morning from, or afternoon from your side, morning from my side. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, tell me, Brent, um, if your concrete is subjected to soft water, can you can your product help in that regard to prevent the the the, the, the erosion of the surface due to uh, soft water? Uh, are you saying soft water? Yeah, soft water. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Um, so abrasion uh, resistance. There are a lot of different parameters that are improved when you fill void space. And one of the parameters that is improved is uh, abrasion resistance. Um, typically we see 30 to 50% or more abrasion resistance improvements. Um, we, we, don't even, we, we don't throw a lot of numbers around typically because it just seems unbelievable that it does all those things, but it's just, it's only doing one thing which is to fill void space. And there happens to be a, a lot of benefits that, that, are, uh, that concrete can experience when you do that. Now, soft water testing, you know, uh, I'm sure, uh, I don't know of any soft water testing that I've done uh, myself. We may have had projects in those situations, but uh, uh, I certainly have no negative experiences to share. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sorry, sorry, Matthews, is that demon water? Are you speaking about demon water? Come again? Are you speaking about demon water as soft water? Yes, 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 sir. Oh, okay. 
Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to leave it at that. We've reached um, four o'clock, but I just want to say a huge thank you to Brent Rollins to joining you. us today. Um, thank you, Brent, for a, a very informative talk. And judging from the amount of questions we've had, we can really tell that the attendees enjoyed that. Um, you see Brent's um, email address on the screen there, abrollins at spraylock.com. And your local supplier or your local agent for Spraylock is Carl White. He is online at the moment. You can find Carl White there. He's waving at us. And um, then I just want to say thank you again to everybody who made this possible. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and a huge thank you again to Creso, who's sponsoring our Concrete Fix webinars. Um, remember to join Cement and Concrete SA as a member. They really as great membership benefits to be had. But in the meantime, hope to see you at our next event. Everybody, I can't even say travel safely. I think what I should say, go and enjoy a nice cup of coffee now. Until next time, take care and thank you, Brent. Thank you.